Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guests today are Lucy Parker and John Miller. I will tell them, tell you all about them in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the, the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it from a leadership purpose, you do it to bring people together for common cause. Welcome, Lucy Parker and John Miller. So, hey. Uh, Lucy Parker and John Miller have a brand new book called The Activist Leader, which we will discuss in our show. Lucy is a former BBC documentary filmmaker. She moved. She's now an executive coach. She works on strategic communications. She's a top corporate advisor and has headed the UK Prime Minister's Task Force on Talent and Enterprise. John Miller uh, had an award-winning career in advertising. And now he shifted to helping the world become better. And we'll talk about that. He's the founder of Open for Business, a coalition of 40 global companies campaigning for LBGTQ plus rights and companies in countries hostile to those rights. Welcome, Lucy and John. So hey. there's a wonderful um, uh, blurb about your book that caught my attention, The Activist Leader. It's a rallying cry for a new generation of leaders who are unafraid to challenge the status quo, confront systematic injustice, and drive positive transformation, and also find a strong business case for such. So, Lucy, what is an activist leader? So, I guess it's the question that goes to the heart of the book. Um, and in the business world, a lot of business leaders would not characterize themselves at first pass as an activist. But I think if you get to the essence of what an activist is, you say this is somebody who looks at the situation in the world and thinks about that situation, there's something wrong, there's something that needs changing. And at that moment they go, and this might have something to do with me. I could make a contribution to this. And an activist leader doesn't think I'm the whole answer to this question, but they think this is mine to do. And I need to mobilize others and mobilize resources, mobilize people, mobilize activity to tackle that challenge. And we think that there's a lot going on around the business world today that means things need changing. And business leaders who step towards that change, recognize it and want to act in order to change, we think are activist leaders. Great. Now, John, um, who should be an activist leader? Is that a frontline employee or is it... The, the man or woman at the top of the house, the CEO. What's your perspective? So I mean, we we often say there's uh, there's more than one leader in a business. <laughs> yeah, it's not just the CEO that's the leader of a business. In fact, there are leaders all throughout a business, uh, at all levels in a business, in all the different parts of a business. And actually, uh, one of the things that we're writing about is what does it mean to be a leader? And actually, um, for us, having that mindset, having the mindset of an activist about you know, the issues in the world around you, that can be the difference between being a manager and being a leader. Um, in the, you know, so we published this book today, actually, is our publication day here in the US. Um, we've had people asking us, um, how did you come up with the idea of the activist leader? Which to us is a slightly strange question because we didn't just like think it up. Lucy and I have been working together for um, 12 years now, um, uh, working with businesses on some of their toughest societal questions, whether that's climate change or biodiversity or plastics in the ocean or privacy and disinformation or human rights in the supply chain. And we've seen that in businesses of all shapes and sizes, in all sectors, there are people who have this different way of thinking about how their business can relate to those issues. And um, we call that way of thinking the activist mindset. Yeah. The theme that I'm hearing in both of you is something that um, it, it's the activism is essentially what executives really do. Um, they may not be in, in the sphere that of the activism that you're speaking about, but they make change. They affect change and they bring people together. So, OK, this is a question for maybe both of you to answer if your perspective. So, Lucy, I'm on a CEO. I'm I like to think of myself as socially minded and I want to make a positive difference. But I'll say to you, I don't know if my board is going to go along with this. I don't know if my customer base would. So what's the 
What do you say, Lucy? It, it, it's uh, it's a good question because it is actually what we meet more or less every day. And I think that in that time we have been working together, what one's seen is that the question of whether you might do something on the side of the business, which was kind of additional to do something that's positive in the world, has moved centre stage. It is, if you are a leader today and you're thinking about leadership tomorrow, we would argue the new expectation is that you know how to deliver financial value and social value in tandem, hand in hand. And if you don't think like that, if you can't think like that, that you are really not in the new expectation of leadership. And what you're seeing is that businesses that step into this space successfully are not seeing it as something additional. They're identifying where big societal questions have in fact become business questions. Are you resilient to the way climate change is going to change your operating context? So these are big societal questions that business is operating within. And have you understood what you are to that question and that question is to you? And that changes the way you lead. So it's not additional and maybe some people will go with you. We're saying leadership today needs to understand that central difference. And it's not I think being a nice company. Yeah. You know, so you can't go to a board and go, oh, we should be nicer. <laughs> you have to root this in what are the commercial imperatives driving this? You know, and, and business leaders know whether it's how do we engage with a, a next generation of consumer, a next generation of employee? How do we ensure the resilience of our supply chain? How do we underpin our license to operate um, in the increasingly active regulatory environment? How do we open up new opportunities to innovate? Think about new markets. So there are, given the intensity of the challenges that the world is facing, businesses have to look at the commercial realities that they now find themselves in. And that's the conversation you can have as a CEO with your board. What, the theme that both of you are hitting in, in this question, but throughout is, if you really want to be a leader, it's not just in your business, but it's also in the culture and the society. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. I think yeah. it's I think there's two faces to what you're saying there. One is there's an awful lot changing in the world. Um, here we are in climate week in New York. You know, the climate conversation is literally on fire around the world. So there aren't any businesses that aren't affected in some form or another by this question. So you need to have a point of view on it. You need to know how you're going to act. So it's partly what's going on in the world around you that you need to be alert to. But I think if we had to pick one thing that is distinctive of the leaders in this space today is that they're not just looking at their own performance. They're looking at what their business is to systemic change. All of these big questions are systemically significant. So it's no longer just about the performance of your business. It's how you help drive change across the ecosystem you operate in. Okay, well there, now a question for John. There are many issues to discuss, climate change, social injustice, a, a potpourri of issues. So how does a company decide, does it decide on what to address? What's your perspective, John? It can be, it can seem really overwhelming, I think, for business leaders. It feels like from all sides, uh, they've got issues coming at them. And of course, they're urgent and important issues. And a business can't take them all on. You have to find some way of going, what do we prioritize? You know, how do we focus? And that's really step one for us is, is focus. What is What are the issues which you as a business are intrinsically a part of? And once you look at it like that, it's not a secret, actually. These issues aren't hiding. You know, it's it's pretty obvious that um, some of the, the really tough, contentious areas that your business is involved in, they are the things you need to be focused. That's where the real opportunity for leadership is. We actually were um, talking to a company here in the US who surveyed their employees to say which issue should we focus on. And this was a pharmaceutical company. And the answer came back, gun crime. And we were like, OK, pharmaceutical company, gun crime, you know, it's an important issue to consumers, to, to employees, clearly, it, it matters to society, but there's not a great deal that a pharmaceutical company is going to do about gun crime, realistically. 
what are the issues that the pharmaceutical companies can potentially take a, a leadership position on with that activist mindset? There's no shortage of them. You know, a whole bunch of disease areas, um, access to medicines, pricing of medicines, um, you know, antimicrobial resistance, all uh, sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, resi resilience of healthcare systems. I mean, you know, what what are the issues that your business is part of? That's where you need to be focused. And it probably answers the question you asked earlier, which is how do you take your board with you? If you're picking the issues that are absolutely integrally related to your business model and your future strategy, mostly the board comes with you because that is a strategic long-term view about sustained profitability. This isn't other than the business. That's a key point. I'm glad you essentially is, is uh, when a company decides and you I'm glad you chose the pharma example, mm -hmm. Um, uh, gun, uh, the gun issue is a, 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 a key significance here in the U.S. and very divisive issue. But um, it's okay to say that's not our um, uh, sandbox. We're going to focus on where we are integrally involved, and that kind of scales the issue, does it not? Hundred percent. Yeah, that, that's entirely our advice. Yeah, and when when you do that, a couple of things happen. First of all. No one's going to take issue with you, you know, choosing this as your problem that you're going to focus on, because everyone can see that you're a part of this. And the, the opportunity, therefore, is you know, to redefine your position on that issue from being continually associated as part of the problem to stepping into the issue, turning and facing into the issue. We talk about the pivot and saying, how can we potentially be a part of solutions? Um, to this issue. because of the role you play in it because it's intrinsic to you also means that you could be part of solving it now part part of that you have um, one of the things that you focus on along with focus is the sense of perspective and the way it's described as um the issues that the world sees what did that specifically mean lucy i'm sorry well we characterize something in the book about if you like a corporate centric attitude. And um, we've in the past said, well, the, the, you can look at a corporate in a traditional sense of, as being like a big citadel and big issues come up over the horizon. And the instinct of the corporate is to squash that issue down, to protect itself, to de-risk. And that's really where the corporate is thinking of itself as the center of the universe and all the issues are outside and trying to get in and break through. This attitude is to say the world is concerned about Carbon's an easy one in Climate Week this week. What are they really concerned about? What are they bothered by? What is the experience of people who are being hit by this in a particular way? And what are we to that? Either are we part of that problem, or if we looked at it a particular way, could we become part of that solution? So to sort of go around the other side and understand what it is the world and the stakeholders that really meet this head on firsthand are concerned about and ask yourself what you are to that problem. Right. Flowing from that is something that you call the pivot, which is turn and face the issue. So does that mean come up with a, a different issue or know where it's relevant to you, John? So, I mean, again, that, you know, the, the traditional corporate mindset, as Lucy is describing it, if you're um, faced with an issue, you're being attacked because of your company's record or your performance on this issue, the traditional corporate mindset is a defensive one to say, oh, you know, that's not us or we're doing this bit or um, to minimize the issue and to actually be saying, you know, uh, to deflect it. But what we're talking about here is actually to turn and pivot into the issue, to face the issue, to say, yeah, we can see we're a part of this um, and we can see we might hold some levers here um, to start generating solutions and around it. Some of the companies that do the best work in this space do it in common cause, which was a phrase you used in your introduction. That thing that worries you, diversity, that thing that worries you, the collapse of the biodiverse natural systems, you're right, that's a worrying thing. That's a real thing you're worried about. And we are big players in the system. How can we help? What could we do that makes a genuine contribution to that issue? So the, the, the pivot is to turn around and make common cause with the concern and then ask yourself authentically, what are we to that? And could we contribute solutions?
You also, in, in, in honing this, this approach to dealing with the issues, the many issues, is you talk about ambition. Yeah. And what is, and I like how it's described, is make a real impact because I, there are so many pressing issues. And how do we avoid the idea of dabbling or lip service? John, you want to take that? A ambition is like it's so essential to what it means to run a business. Yeah. Right. I mean, you had Sam Walton say high expectations are the key to everything. When Bill Gates set up Microsoft, he did so with the ambition to put a, a personal computer on every desk and in every home. Anything big that's happened in business or in actually our lives <laughs> tends to happen because we've got a, a sense of ambition for making something happen. These are big and difficult issues. We're not going to tackle them unless we really mean it. And so businesses need to have that same sense of ambition um, to, to make a genuine impact on the issues. And when we see that happen, we see the business then start to mobilise around that. And I love your word dabble, John, because a lot of businesses that we work with or encounter will say to us, oh, you know, we're, we're very concerned about being accused of greenwashing. And... We will say, well, the real question on the table is you're a big business, maybe a pharmaceutical business, maybe a food retail business, maybe a mining company, a big business, right? And the question that's really coming at you from the world is if you're such a big player in this system, is the action you take commensurate with, does it match the scale of the issue and the scale of the company? And when companies get accused of greenwashing, very often the source of that challenge is you're dabbling. You say you care about this stuff, but it's little and peripheral. You put your toe in the water, you did a good thing, and then you hoped that we would all go, that was great. But the world is looking at these huge scale companies that are shaping systems and going, things need changing. And we need people who can help us change the system we operate in. If you're so strong, if you're such a big systemic player, What's your contribution to this question? Now, uh, do you have, uh, John or, or uh, Lucy, a hero story? So, for example, a company that wasn't sure it should do X, but did, took a chance, did it, and it achieved spectacular results, and that's fair. Either of you? What, one of my uh, f favorite areas of story in the book are stories around what we call disruption, because, of course, these are... Uh, uh, these are a very big, complex questions that you know we're talking about here, and um, they're not going to be changed by tinkering. <laughs> um, you know, this is not about incremental changes to existing ways of doing things. This is about actually rethinking. Let's see if we can do this differently. So um, the trouble with that is that businesses are so often given so many no's. If a business is just trying to make something happen, um, it's there's always a you know a hundred reasons why. It's too difficult. We can't do it. The business model doesn't exist. The commercial models won't allow it. The materials aren't right. An example of a, 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 a real breakthrough moment that we really admire is Apple, who made, yeah, they had a big ambition to make their products without taking any more materials from the earth. So really circular economy. Um, and But one of their main uh, raw materials is aluminium. And we all know that aluminium has a, an enormous um, carbon footprint and is very difficult to recycle um, and it looked like that was going to be impossible for them but Apple's response to that was to go well maybe we need to invent a new type of aluminium then and so working with partners that's exactly what they did they developed a new type of aluminium which is recyclable so that uh, Apple products now the MacBook is you know they have MacBooks out which are made of completely recycled aluminium, and that's a game changer. And once you do that for a product like a MacBook, that material is then available for others to use in other sectors. So, you know, this is this is about going, well, what if we had to do it? How would we make it happen? You know, what I like about that story, John, is because when we talk about activism, at least in my mind, I'm thinking of the social justice issues, which are so critical. Um, what you just talked about with Apple's example is, hey, let's let's use our manufacturing expertise and re-engineer the process. So um, it's marvelous. have you noted that, Lucy? Yes, well, completely. And we, we have about two dozen stories in the book, and they're all examples of a similar thing. And when you ask right at the beginning of this conversation, well, what makes an activist? Um, we think that 
an activist is is somebody who goes this this big thing needs to happen I, i'm not the whole answer to it but what can i mobilize how do i draw in energy how do i draw in resources to make this happen and there's another story like that that we talk about in the book which i think is very instructive to your perspective question walmart a lot of walmart's business ends up in the fields and they grow stuff and they have really taken on board the question about the collapse of biodiversity and were saying we need to, to change things and when they told their suppliers what was expected in this new way of thinking who did they bring to share with their suppliers they brought people whose expertise is biodiversity whose expertise is what are bees to pollination whose expertise is what's happening in the oceans today and they said we've educated our leadership team with a different perspective of people for whom this is their expertise and we want to share this with our supply chain 2000 companies we expect you to start behaving differently about the products you provide to us because we have to change the natural ecosystem that is an activist response and they are taking the perspective of people way outside the company and they said we've learned we've been educated by them and we want to share it with you and what they can mobilize is 2000 other companies so it doesn't matter whether it's a you know we'll invent a new kind of aluminium that can be recycled or we've got 2000 suppliers and we'll educate them what needs to change about natural systems that's an activist response that's not waiting for a regulation that's not waiting to be told by somebody else it's taking a view of the situation in the outside world and looking at what you can mobilize to change the system around you to achieve it yeah. I think we're going to get to something because the two cases, this Apple and Walmart, it's not just altruism. There is a business case for such change. Can you dive into that, John? So, yeah, I mean, the, the commercial imperatives. So I, I, I can think of what's actually happening in the world. Right. I mean, we've had only this. Um, you know, summer, we've had the uh, the hottest ever day on Earth, the hottest June on Earth, the hottest July on Earth. We've had like the highest ever um, global sea, uh, ocean temperatures, the lowest um, ever um, levels of sea ice uh, in the in the Arctic. Now, or, or you take some of the uh, social justice issues, as you uh, call them, you know, half of all um, people in poverty here in the US, in the UK, Come from working families. Uh, these are these are really big, serious issues. Are we really saying that business has nothing to do with those issues? I mean, uh, the the operating environment for business is changing. Um, the the set of risks that business needs to think about uh, is changing. That will create opportunities too. But I think the, um, the the leaders that we're talking about, with the activist mindset that we're talking about are thinking about those issues, the environment that they're operating in, uh, in, a, in a different way. So when you talk about business case, I think, you know, we often joke with people when we're talking about this, show us the business case for not acting. Given the state that the world is in, given, given the, the severity of the challenges um, that the world is facing and the pivotal role that business is playing, the world is looking to business to, to play a part in these issues and the uh, the sustainable profitability of business depends upon them doing so. And a lot of conventional thinking about the business case is to add up what you can see, where a lot of the business case now is the challenge of not taking action. And in, in this summer that John was just describing very vividly, you know, an energy company in southern Italy um, found that the whole of the region's electricity went out because their cables underground melted in that heat. <sighs> Yes, exactly. Wow. They hadn't seen that coming. And the cost to the business of rectifying that and the emergency resources that had to come in. And it was literally said, we just didn't think it would happen that fast. So businesses that aren't responding to these outside pressures and thinking, what strategically are these questions to us? How are we mitigating that risk? What's the business <laughs> case <that> not acting? <laughs> As you're explaining this, I'm thinking of a, a, a phrase that uh, many of the listeners in my audience will know, the, the great Harvard professor, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who said about change is that 
We change when it hurts too much not to change, yes. which is just what you're focusing on. And that drives the business case. It drives the social imperative. So, um, all right. So people are hearing this and they're saying, all right. So if I'm an employee in an organization, is there something I can do or do I need to be a CEO? John? Well, there, I mean, we all have the, the ability to you know, influence people around us to understand what's going on, um, to talk about that. I think, you know, as we were talking about earlier, there's you don't have there's more than one leader in a business, right? It's not just the, uh, the CEO. So there are people all throughout the business who can join together. Uh, I mean, we've seen the rise of, um, of employee activism as well. But then, um, I mean, I think there are lots of different ways of people get, of lots of people getting involved. It doesn't just have to be um, the leadership. And actually, lots of companies are encouraging that now. Too, you know, I mean, there's a uh, we're seeing increasingly you know, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, next generation boards being developed um, so to to enable business leaders at the top of the company to to really understand what people uh, at all levels of the company are thinking. So there are different ways that that's being facilitated and encouraged uh, at the moment. But I mean, you don't have to wait to become CEO in order to start getting involved in some of these questions and you know as we say in the book actually you becoming engaged with some of these issues deciding what really matters to you and then starting to you know take whatever action you're able to take uh, on that that is leadership starting to happen that is what leadership actually means so it potentially can can be a path towards um, you know more senior levels correct well, um, uh, we are racing along here, and I could go for another hour or so, but we all have time constraints. So um, as you know, I ask every guest on the show a story of grace. Do either or both of you want to share one? Lucy? So. Well, I was thinking, as John was describing earlier, sort of case studies, one of the reasons we love to do this, it, it goes back to your perspective question. And I can think of us both working in a palm oil company. If you are a palm oil company today, you are under pressure. And in fact, in arriving in a palm oil company, they'll say, you know, we do need to tell you this is extreme pressure, right? And everybody's against us. What are we going to do? And they want to tell you they're good. They didn't mean any harm. But the fact is the business model of the industry is derived from chopping down forests. You work in this way, you help people take that perspective from the outside, the people who understand the consequences of chopping down the forest, the people who live in the forest who lose their livelihoods, who bring that question to the leadership. And we see, we saw, we were excited to see the leadership of a particular business go, oh, you're telling us we could be the people to say no to deforestation. And we said, Yes, that is what we say. Can you do that? And there was a long pause and the CEO said, we could do that. Now, to me, that's grace under pressure. That is actually turning around the whole question and thinking there may be something in that. Instead of just defending yourself and going, we're the good guys. We didn't mean it. It's not like that. You go, ah, you might be right. We might have to change the way we think about it and become part of the contribution to a solution. Ah. I mean, that's breathtakingly different. And to me, that is grace under pressure, and it's why we do what we do. And that's what gets you going, um, I think. But then actually, it, ta it takes some grace under pressure to keep going uh, yes. as well. I, I love the question. We're, we're actually sitting here in a building called the Grace Building, <laughs> that's um, true, yeah. uh, overlooking uh, Bryant Park here, here in, in New York. But when, when I think we see um, grace under pressure working in, in, in the kinds of you know situations that we're talking about it's often because you know these are these are incredibly different difficult sometimes impossible seeming issues um to take on and any leader at any level of of a business will always in, you know run up against the next barrier fall over at the next hurdle like the the whole thing derails again and again people keep saying no this can't be done and i think the real grace is 
having that clarity of vision, that clarity of purpose, that this matters, okay? that this business needs to be part of this conversation, needs to be taking action on this issue, picking yourself up, getting yourself back involved. And that's you'll, grace under pressure. You'll often say, you know, this is what leadership is. This is not, this is not business as usual. This is not management speak. This is we need to carve new ways of doing things. That's what makes a leader a preparedness to walk into a new way of doing things. And you can see people grow. They kind of go, wow, I, this could define my leadership, that I'm part of this kind of leader that the world now needs more. So it, it, the whole arena is inspiring to work in because people have to find it in themselves to have that conviction. Great. I love this uh, interview and the, the work that you're doing. Is there a website where people can learn more about either of you or the book? So, yeah. Well, the, the book is called The Activist Leader. Um, <laughs> and it looks like this. <laughs> and, uh, and you can Google that. There's a, there is a website for it. It's also available on all good online retailers and, uh, and offline retailers um, too. And we'd love people to, get, to have a look, get involved, let us know what you think. Right. Lucy Parker and John Miller, thank you very much for sharing your time today. Thank you for wow. to to you. You're working on a great cause for all of us. So with that, we'll go out. Thank you. <laughs>